This is Duke University. So um, this round table, um, what we're doing here is we're trying to um, just sort of raise some questions that have come up um, for our three round tablers uh, throughout the conference, uh, the workshop rather. And, um, and after they've spoken for about seven minutes probably each, um, we are going to open up the floor for people um, to make comments themselves, um, ask questions of each other, have something of a conversation, okay, before we, before we close off. Um, and first up um, is going to be Stephanie Clare. And Stephanie, um, uh, in, your, in your bios, you don't have Stephanie um, here because very kindly she has stepped in at the last moment um, for, um, for Kate Bartlett, who's sick. And, um, and, uh, and we will post Stephanie's bio, however, on, on the Feminist Theory Workshop as, as we will with Martha Kenny, who, who stepped in, because I know that a lot of you will want to, um, want to make contact and have conversations um, uh, among you. So let me just introduce um, Stephanie now. Um, Stephanie, um, Stephanie's work is really an original and much needed contribution to the field of gender and science, particularly in the realm of, uh, of feminist new materialisms. She poses questions about fem phenomenological underst the phenomenological understanding of sense, um, and the way in which new materialisms ask us to think, sense differently. Um, she has published um, in, uh, in, in this field, in the fields of queer theory and feminist theory, um, in GLQ. She has an essay um, called Is the Rectum a Mirror? In Differences <laughs> recently, Feeling Cold, Phenomenology, Spatiality, and the Politics of Sensation. In Hypatia, Agency, Signification, and Temporality. She has an amazing range of interests, um, and, um, and she has been writing on, um, the bo on body temperature, in Fanon's writing, um, in, um, on Butler, on Mahmoud, Deleuze, Bergson. She's really you know, very varied in her, um, in her interests. And she has an article coming out pretty soon, um, unless it just came out, or pretty soon, um, in Diacritics called Geopower, The Politics of Life and Land in Franz Fanon's writing. And she is going to start us off. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm happy and honored to be on this closing panel today, and I hope this is the starting point for a conversation. Um, I begin by bringing attention to a series of asides that were spoken or preambles in our conference, because I think these comments um, were interesting and they called for other discussions or other conversations. So one of these conversations could be on butch mothering and the panopticon's allure. Um, I think another conversation would be on the challenges and limitations of recycling and the perils of plastic, because I drink out of my water bottle. Another on uh, urinals and gender neutral bathrooms. Um, and on the use of Twitter in changing intellectual conversation, academic publishing, and attention. Um, but in the place of focusing on these interesting asides, I want to look instead at a question that has haunted me across these past two days. And this is the question of feminist theory's archive. To what text do we turn to produce feminist theory? In response to what do we write? What is our relationship to the archives with which we work? And how are we producing and reproducing ourselves when we turn to certain texts? Um, Alondra Nelson began her talk this morning citing the Kumbahi River Collective. She quoted, quote, um, I believe that the most profound and potentially most radical politics comes directly out of our own identity. Nelson argued that critiques or dismissals of identity dismiss a powerful tradition of black feminist thought. Her comments highlighted the tension between theories on the one hand that highlight the impossibility or undesirability of subject formation, and those on the other hand that deploy the subject as a primary analytic frame. 
This is a long-standing tension in feminist thought, one that was central in debates concerning post-structuralism or postmodernism in feminist theory. It has not gone away in or been addressed by the more recent turn to what might be called new feminist materialisms. And so I'm grateful that Nelson brought this up today. Um, but I wonder, rather than focus on the tension between identitarian and non-identitarian forms of politics, we might instead call for a practice of making visible one's relationship to the different archives with which we think. Um, so, a bit of biography. I began my undergraduate career as a joint honors student in philosophy and math. When I received 100% on a midterm in ordinary differential equations, the professor insisted that I must not have taken the exam. He insisted in front of all the other students to see my notebook. He wanted to check that the handwriting may, uh, matched the, the, the test, right, to make sure I'd written it. At the time, I was, and I'm sad to say this, but it's true, embarrassed, not infuriated. Um, this is a moment that made it clear to me that I was going to leave math. Um, however, in my first academic publication on notions of agency in Mahmoud and Butler's writing, I could not but include a little bit of calculus. I wanted a graph. I thought it was beautiful. I missed math. Please, I asked the editors, let me keep it. Why? Why did I keep it there? What was its effect? Why was I attached to it? I tell this story to make a particular point. Although um, drawing on quantum physics or French philosophy might undo identitarian claims, turning to these archives, I surmise, come from particular located positions, even from an identity. Some of us um, might not only be subjectified by these particular archives, such that our sense of self is entangled with them, but also we might love these archives. What is the form of this love or attachment? What can we do with it? What do, do we want to challenge it? When do we want to use it? How do we want to use it? I wonder whether one way to speak to each other across disciplines, histories, and locations then might be to make visible our relationship to our archives, to insist that we locate ourselves in such a way that we might um, read the discipline. Oh, yeah, sorry. No. To insist that we locate ourselves in such a way might be read as a disciplinary imperative to form ourselves as coherent, recognizable subjects. But I want to say that even to provide this critique of my insistence that we locate ourselves um, has, comes from a particular location, or comes from, for instance, loving Foucault. So what's, why do we love Foucault? Um, <laughs> can I keep going a little? Yeah. OK, so my, my own book manuscript, Earthly Encounters, Power, Sensation, and Identity, works on expanding the archive of feminist theory, even feminist philosophy. The book responds to a recent approach in the humanities and interpretive social sciences that seeks to foreground materiality, affect, and movement, but in doing so often skirts questions of representation, identity, social hierarchy, and property. In contrast, I show how sensation accounts for more than human material worlds, all while bringing attention to the historical production and meaning of these sensations. One of the central arguments of the book is that phenomenology, especially the work of Maurice Merleau-Ponty and Franz Fanon, provide a useful point of reference for contemporary critical theory. Um, while highlighting phenomenology, the book, though, is not tethered to a particular philosophical canon. I argue for the relevance of phenomenology, but I also turn to autobiographical writing and political creative nonfiction. Texts such as Gloria Anzaldúa's Borderlands, La Frontera, Bessie Head's A Question of Power, and Lee Maracle's Raven Songs. Um, these texts blend philosophy with autobiography, poetry, literature, history, and politics. Written from particular historical and geographical locations, locations shaped by colonial and settler colonialisms, they archive embodied engagements in more than human worlds. I turn to this archive, um, or I do not rather engage in a detailed close analysis of any one canonical philosopher then to widen philosophy's archive, to show the conceptual relevance of voices outside the discipline without subsuming these voices within this discipline. I work not in the name of diversity, which assumes that differences can be known, named, or consumed, but rather in the purposes of humility. This humility refuses to universalize my own white Western position that is tied to a particular canon. Um, I seek to challenge, though will never rid myself of, the privilege, the privilege of ignorance entangled in that position. Okay, and so I leave these two days with a renewed belief that feminist theory's call to locatedness, to situated knowledges, remains an important feature for speculative modes of investigation. I see this kind of this call for locatedness not only as an important starting point for conversations across histories and disciplines, but also as a political practice for recreating ourselves, whoever we may be, differently. Thanks. Do you want to stand or
sit. I'm going to sit. I'm going to sit. Yeah, okay. We're old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to stand. <laughs> So, um, so next we're going to Ellen Mortensen, and Ellen is a professor of comparative literature and gender studies at the University of Bergen. She has published widely, um, including um, The Feminine and Nihilism, Lucy Rigore with Nietzsche and Heidegger um, from 1994, Touching Thought, Ontology and Sexual Difference, 2003, and she's the editor also of the anthology Sex, Breath and Force from 2006. Well, thank you. And thank you uh, for the invitation to come here um, from the old country. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just got off the boat. No, I'm, just, I'm kidding. Um, I, um, I'm very pleased to be here, and, uh, and I'm honored to uh, be asked to uh, be part of the group sessions and to uh, also be on this uh, last panel. And uh, along with my uh, colleagues from the Center for uh, Gender and Women's Research at the University of Bergen, we think it's wonderful to be able to come here and partake in this exchange and the ongoing dialogue uh, of uh, 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 feminist theory. And uh, I want to preface also that I just came from uh, a group uh, a group session, group session four. And I have to say that I was uh, deeply impressed by the students uh, who were there. Uh, I thought we must have uh, gathered an exceptional, gifted, and well-informed uh, group of students. Uh, and we had a, a fascinating discussion. And so I hope that some of the students that were part of our group will participate in this and to uh, intervene in this uh, last session uh, now. Uh, usually I hate rhetoric of humility, but uh, I, I hope that you will um, bear with me because I literally have not had time to prepare a manuscript like uh, Stephanie here uh, because I just come from the session. So uh, I'll just give you some, some comments on my uh, impressions and thoughts throughout these two days and uh, the different talks. And I'll try to formulate um, a couple of points or questions to, to each of the talks. And then you do uh, with it as you wish. Um, with, um, when it comes to Penelope Deutscher, uh, of course she, um, as I've used the wording, swims in the same waters as I do textually. Uh, and so uh, there was much food for thought for me in that, uh, in her uh, reading of Derrida and Nietzsche and uh, through her innovative, you could say deconstructive reading, she brought the two in proximity with each other in a way that, um, at least for my part, and hopefully uh, for uh, yours, uh, brought up, opened up new possibilities. Something in her reading, uh, to quote Penelope, was neither Derrida nor Nietzsche. No, sorry, that was a <laughs> slip. Uh, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get back to him. Uh, uh, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Derrida and Foucault, and, uh, and this uh, perhaps uncanny merging on uh, the question of sexual difference that is alluded to yet not elaborated by either one of them. But my question to Penelope would be, uh, uh, is, uh, and, and I found your, your talk both fascinating and, and innovative, but the silencing of Luce Irigaray and her work on sexual difference, uh, except perhaps in the Q&A session where you alluded to sexual difference as perhaps the task of the future, uh, uh, you were not, she was, she was not uh, dealt with uh, in your talk, um, but at the same time, you echoed her in your title. 
um, refer, you know, in my reference book, taking us back to the sex which is not one, and, and also in, in many of the problematics that you laid out, the obvious uh, mediator or, or interconnected uh, text that could have brought you somewhere further in that, in your reading of Foucault and, and, and um, Derrida, would have been um, Irigure. And uh, so I, I find it interesting that it was, I understand we can't do everything, but especially using the term sexual difference that in many ways, uh, I wouldn't say uh, have been, has been uh, um, uh, only connected to the work of, of Lucie Rigaray, but, but her intervention, both in terms of this psychoanalytic notion of sexual difference, the Lacanian uh, specifically, but also her, her work on, on uh, um, opening up a space for that which remains unthought, especially given the very strict framing of, well, uh, of um, sexual difference in terms of the pre pregnant woman's body in the text that, that you, um, that you um, presented for us through Hugo and, and uh, Derrida's um, astute reading of it. Yet, um, it seems to me that when you, um, uh, that is sort of that missing bridge, if you want. And uh, I don't know if you, you would agree with me. Um, also, when you, um, the, the, the image of the pregnant woman's body uh, is a recurring image that we find in everything from, of course, Hugo's text um, arguing for abolition of the death penalty, the scaffold, uh, and uh, the emergence of uh, the new French democracy, so to speak, um, is a, an image that we also see appropriated by everything from the Nazis to social democrats in current Scandinavia. So, you know, the, how do you negotiate uh, a figure? I, I thought it was just left hanging there. And that's part of what we're supposed to do, but that's what um, I, I was kind of lacking. And, um, well, I think that's enough for you, Penelope. Is that okay? <laughs> okay, let's move on. In. <laughs> It's only getting worse, I promise you. <laughs> uh, so, moving on to, to Karen Barad, and I assure you, this is not a progress, progressive narrative. Um, <laughs> my lack of training in science in general, and physics in particular, might become evident in, my, in the following poetic reading of Barad's imaginative pr presentation which I fear might need correction afterwards from the speaker. However, this is what I weaned from her dazzling performance, because I got kind of a vertigo through all of those PowerPoints. <laughs> yeah. This is it. New queer ontologies emerge out of the quantum leap Aww. caused by the... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you caused by the entanglement of electrons on a futon. <laughs> Emerging from the performance of an experiment involving an apparatus where two clits touch. <laughs> well. <laughs> Kidding aside. Barad's um, presentation led me to ponder one question in particular. I had many, uh, but I have to, for the sense of uh, economy, uh, restrict myself to one. And I think it was broached in the Q&A without really being answered. And uh, my question would be, what is the status of queer agency in imaginative practices and 
for justices to come. In light of our thinking of matter and nature as that to which we will be, uh, uh, matter and nature as that which by necessity deconstructs us and reconfigures us, irrespective of our own willing. That is a serious question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, th I, th I, 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 I really liked uh, the way in which we were brought into uh, the world of physics, of which I understand nothing, and yet trying to um, enter into a dialogue with a Derridian text that I at least believe that I'm fairly familiar. And I felt that I could follow her uh, in and out of many of these, uh, um, well, I don't know what to call them, but uh, um, I was lost, and I think that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> so let's move on to, um, to Alondra Nelson. Um, in, uh, my, in our group, group number four, um, we touched upon this text in many different ways, this uh, lecture on, in many different ways, and very, very interesting ones, and I hope that some of the others will um, supplement me here. But one of the things that I um, uh, was struck by is uh, this, this uh, longing for an origin, where an origin cannot, in fact, be reached, and to what uh, lengths we will go to try to reconstruct it or to construct it or to imaginatively project it. Um, and uh, which is the, the, the case um, not only for African American um, people searching for their genealogy. For those of us who grew up with Ibsen know that genealogy is fraught with many perils and much fiction. Uh, but but uh, it also reminded me of uh, the, 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 the kind of longing that we find in, in, in the queer uh, search for some kind of, of identity. Uh, I have to use it uh, under erasure. Um, especially uh, looking through archives that do not include uh, that what you're seeking for. And, and there's this, I'm not saying it's the same, but there's a certain analogy here between this search for an origin or for um, some kind of belonging that uh, is not um, given in that which, in, in the, the, the referential archive that we uh, try to seek through. And uh, all of this notion of, um, of going and uh, of making use of modern technology to uh, try to um, find answers for this and create some kind of narrative that with which we can live, uh, as you call it a, a sort of self-fashioning. Um, but uh, what it usually leads us to, and which I thought you brilliantly showed in your talk today uh, was that it just leads us onto other paths of uncertainty and, and perhaps fictions that we might not live well by. In addition, capitalism makes a field day of it. Uh, so, <laughs> and I'm a sucker myself because I bought one of those things, but that's another matter. But I traced, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually, Actually, my, it brought me back 40,000 years to Nigeria. Yes, so, uh, but, yes, yeah, so we're all basically, but that, you know, and that creates another problem of how do you, the racial decodings of, of this that happen, and um, I won't go into it, but my maternal line was also uh, decoded as 99% European, but in that in the, is also the, the indigenous people of the Sami, which is a, a strain in my 
um, northern Norwegian heritage. So you know, it, it only complicates the picture uh, for this. But um, so my, my question is, just to bring Nietzsche into the conversation here, um, uh, is, uh, isn't much of what we're actually engaged in, in some way, forms of aesthetic projections, fictions, poetic imaginings of what we were, are, and could be? Um, and that any kind of quest to find a coherent narrative will inevitably fail, yet we seem to insist to try. And so um, that also brings us a little back to Penelope and uh, the questions, especially in the paper that you asked us to read. But uh, to, to then end up with, am I going too far? Yeah, I think you're fine. I mean, you're going, it's a bit long, but. OK, let me rephrase that. It's just, yeah, yeah. It's just longer than I said, but I it's think it's It's not that fine. easy to no, think. No, 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 it's easy. impossible. <laughs> it's an impossible task. OK. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm going to cry myself to sleep. But anyways. Um, <laughs> Yeah, really. I will. <laughs> yeah, I have a, an epic tendency, I guess. No. Uh, uh, when it comes to, to, to Karen Engel's uh, talk, which I also thought was fascinating and, and in an area that I am uh, totally ignorant, uh, the, the questions that you, uh, that you asked um, and uh, showing through the, the whole notion of, of the framing of, of, uh, of uh, sexual violence within these resolutions, um, going from uh, gendered to gender neutral and what it actually does and does not do. I thought, you know, I thought it was uh, very interesting, you know, the kinds of possibilities that this kind of discourse opens up for and what it actually closes off and that there is a trade-off always uh, in and, and a contestation of, of what, what is to be, um, to win so, some kind of hegemonic status within these, these discourses. And the, the question that emerged was also, uh, to what extent is also feminism and feminist theory, femi mo the way in which we theorize uh, these, these questions responsible for the appropriation that travels uh, in these different institutions and, and, and uh, but, uh, so I thought that one way that, that connected your talk in an uncanny way to Karin Barad's talk is always a question of framing, of something that is being joined together as something just to be disjoined the next moment. There's a, tr there's a movement that nobody really controls but that is happening all the time. And, and we can't say who is actually responsible for this, but it happens. This, uh, you could say, traveling concepts that are being appropriated. And in Norway, we have the phenomenon of state feminism, where you take certain aspects and, and the whole governmental apparatus are just forced into it, and all of a sudden, you have unforeseen consequences of something that you thought were benevolent in the first place. And you can't really <coughs> pin anybody down as, as responsible for it. So uh, in a sense, uh, you ended also up in, in this notion that there was a lack of agency um, in this, uh, as, as a consequence of this um, appropriation. And yet, we have to ask, what is actually the agency, or who is the agency that speaks then? Um, and where do you locate it? And I'll just end up, because something that I thought was common in all four talks is that we end up in some form of anonymity, in some kind of neutrality, in some kind of uh, the feminine body that could be, the pregnant body that could be anybody but gendered, uh, 
there's a, uh, and, and I don't know what to do with that. I also think that the, the, the consequence of Barad's talk is that we, uh, that agency is somewhat depersonalized and molecularized. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> so, well, let me, let me just, just introduce, introduce, <laughs> I just introduce you very briefly. So, so next we have, finally we have Gillian Harkins. Uh, Gillian is an Associate Professor of English and Adjunct Associate Professor of Gender, Women and Sexuality Studies at the University of Washington. And she's the author of Everybody's Family Romance, Reading Incest in Neoliberal America, came out in 2009 from the University of Minnesota Press. And she is currently at work on a book entitled Screening Pedophilia, Virtuality and Other Crimes Against Nature. Um, I wanted to thank um, everyone involved in the conference also for inviting me. I, I get really close to the microphone in a panicked way. Can you hear me if I'm back here? Yeah. Great. Um, I also want to thank uh, the members of the workshop that I was just part of. Uh, I feel now I would be remiss to not say that uh, a lot of my thinking changed right in the middle of that very provocative <laughs> workshop and um, has left me uh, maybe just sharing a few observations. Um, one of the things I'd been thinking before the workshop was about the problem of the concept of justice and uh, some of the ways in which, as many people have pointed out in the conference, um, commensurability or different ways in which figures and analogies, different uh, rhetorical forces seem to be at work when we organize ourselves and orient ourselves toward the concept of justice and that to do justice to the talks, of course, is to put me in a position to try to make sense of or make commensurate very, very different uh, methods and objects across the talks. And so I'd been thinking about epistemic violence and what it means to organize these talks into coherent patterns. And then I changed completely in the middle of the workshop. And so now um, I'm just going to say a few things in the aftermath of what I would have said and now what I'm going to say. Um, so uh, one of the things that has interested me the most uh, working through the, the talks the last couple of days um, is, uh, as I just said, the relationship between uh, concepts and figures. Um, and I think uh, Karen Broad gave us a really lovely way of thinking about the concept and its uh, mattering and its materialization or as uh, itself a kind of an experimental mode. And um, one of the things that, yeah, you know, coming from the literature perspective, I really questioned was how and when um, we see those concepts materializing and how they're mattering tape shape when we uh, install them as critical meta languages or as the languages of feminism or feminist theory. So what exactly happens when a concept is put into that experimental mode and is made to matter? Um, and then how does it circulate? And I found that um, figures, obviously, um, analogies in particular, although we heard a little bit about narrative, uh, have played such a central role across the talks, um, doing in fact a significant amount of uh, critical labor to uh, exemplify or to uh, render those points of contact that are otherwise um, being made uh, very anew as part of our critical language. And so I noticed in our workshop, um, Barad's language, I almost said infected us all, a broad language uh, uh, seemed to, we did this little thing go around and pick one word to, to speak to some things that were on your mind, and, and it seemed like a lot of that language um, was really capturing things that might still be intangible intellectually. And I wondered, again, about um, how the kinds of archives we select and the kind of objects we read maybe call forth new concepts, um, and then when they remain just figurative language, when these are tropes or analogies, and when those analogies and tropes either uh, are materialized as concepts in practice, like in legal institutions, or in often in ways that we don't want, I'm pretty happy to say, um, that in almost all of the experience I have, um, the concepts that mean most to me uh, materialize in ways that I don't want, and that's either that I'm very, very clumsy, or that, um, as Laudra Nelson pointed out, the techniques that I have at my disposal, or the tactics, or the ways I even think about mediation and materialization are not really adequate to the kind of feminist um, justice <coughs> that might interest me the most. And so in other words, I think um, I am myself trying to recalibrate and think about across the papers uh, what it means when we use an analogy. Uh, the puppy mill was you know, such a striking moment um, compared to the maternal, what was the maternal analogy? The, the umbilical cord. Um, there are so many, for me, very troubling 
uh, analogy is sort of in the air and, uh, and thinking about uh, aesthetics and what it means to, uh, to think about aesthetics as a practice of mattering and materialization and what would happen if we kind of looked at the mid-scale between the papers. So we definitely had sort of two papers that worked very closely and in very nuanced ways against uh, what I think uh, R.O. Wilson called classical languages or what we might think of as our received critical metal languages, the language of Derrida, which you were so elegant in um, reminding us to return to in a greater specificity in Foucault. Um, so as we return to those um, classical languages, I'm of course like, well, what makes a language received, as Alondra Nelson questioned at the beginning of her talk, um, what concepts come to seem passe or come to seem to be obstacles to new interrogation, um, something I've written about a little bit around neoliberalism and the category of genre, um, in what ways do specific aesthetic forms or, or practices of mediation or representation, you know, when do they get in the way, when do they sediment, when do they become I had beautiful notes, like beautiful <laughs> notes quoting everybody and everyone's beautiful language. Um, uh, I think uh, Alondra Nelson talked about certainly um, race as a logic of structural inequality regardless of how the concept itself um, might be redeployed and circulated and I think that's an unfair quote to just pull because there was a much, much more lovely one somewhere in here. Um, or the ingenuity of activists in shrinking terrain. The fact that there might be a way in which in that mid-scale between the nuanced questioning of the terms and the institutional incorporation of those terms in the, in the papers on law by Engels and um, Engel. Hello, <laughs> 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 um, Slip. So, uh, it is family, private, property, and state. Um, and so, there's been a remarkable lack of Marxism, and my world is so super saturated with feminist socialisms and Marxisms. So I've been fascinated by that. I didn't want to bring it up, but then I was like, but then it just, it just crept out <laughs> um, in terms of meta languages. And so, um, so, I think as we shift scale, I might be not very coherent, but hopefully I can clear it up later. Um, that very micro focus, sort of looking at how language functions and using analogies to kind of press us to think about concepts, and then the institutional practices that have taken up and organized or remade what we might understand to be the techniques and uh, the tactics for political struggle, even when they might appear as a search for origins, right? Which is not really what I heard exactly in that talk. And so, so how do we understand what? is emerging across these talks. And what, what is that in the middle, which is of course for me, literary studies. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but you know, I kind of focus on the institutional, I mean, because every time I hear imagination or aesthetics, I of course you know, think insidious Foucaultian models of um, incorporative institutional practice, not imaginative spaces. Um, and my own work on virtuality tends to be about its capture in particular kinds of visual forms. Right, and so I tend to be, you know, very sinister and, and full of things about coercion. But I do wonder, um, when we look at that middle scale, how analogies and concepts are materialized in institutions such as academic discourse and our meta languages. Um, whether a little attention to the aesthetic, or how um, language, or how our imagined futurities get installed, um, that's something that interests me a great deal. I had a lot of things to say about natality and really smart things to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'd like us to get a chance to, I think I had a whole Lacan Rome discourse business happening at one point. Um, but I think instead of taking up more of the time up here, it'd be great to turn it over to our discussion. But thank you very much for listening to my off the cuff. <laughs> So um, Claire Cunahan and over here and Leila Aldosani have, um, have mics. So what I'd like to do is have some conversation, discussion. It can be, there can be, of course, questions to the panelists, um, uh, but also conversations among you. Um, uh, and um, 
And I think, you know, it would be great if we heard um, from anyone um, about what was the most urgent to you um, that came up in the seminars. I mean, obviously, there's, I, I sort of went and spent a little bit of time in each one. There seemed to be really dynamic conversations going on. Um, so it would be great to hear um, a little bit about those so you can all get a sense of the different things that were, were going on then. And then... Um, and then I think that, that, that maybe at about um, quarter past, maybe even 20 past, I'll, I'll just check in with, with our keynote speakers to see if they would like to respond to things that have come up and that have been said, questions that have been posed. But first of all, let's get, get some, um, some conversation going from others. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> what archives we're using. And so I wanted to ask a question about materiality and thinking about this from an economic perspective of what it means for poor people to theorize. And we're talking about these archives that are institutional archives. Um, and so what does that mean for how we're thinking about feminist theory still um, in terms of which archives get privileged, um, how that still disassociates the create a creativity from that as well as thinking about if we're talking about challenging disciplines where archives of science are being used as we're saying feminist theory is challenging science but we're still using archives that are again institutionalized outside of what other cultures have theorized about energy about biology whatever the case may be and so how do we how do we use feminist theory to to do that kind of work um, as opposed to letting those um, institutionalized archives take precedent or privilege. What happens? Do we, I we don't think. answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have something to say, sure. But I think that, yeah. or anyone, if anyone has something to say, I mean, it's, yeah. Yes. About this. It can be mm. one of you. If you I, Stephanie might have something to say. It looks like you have... Sorry, I didn't mean, I'm not putting you on the spot at all, but it just looked like you were gearing up to say something. Oh. But if you're not, that's fine. <laughs> but I, I can start just yeah. to say yeah. one thing, is that uh, one of the things that uh, I think that is perhaps lacking both in Europe and in the United States is the way in which we ourselves are implicated in this problematic. <laughs> that is, for most of us, we find ourselves in fairly privileged position, and I'm not talking about the non-tenured people who struggle materially all over the place, uh, but I'm especially talking about people in tenured positions and so on, and that especially when we make uh, not only the use, the, the kinds of archives we, we um, engage with, but also the way in which we use them, uh, is, you know, I think we have uh, quite a ways to go uh, in almost every discipline um, to be more imaginative and, and, and perhaps step out of our own comfort zone uh, and, and to widen the perspective uh, that pertains to, to economic differences. Um, and uh, I was thinking about this in terms of uh, Penelope's talk and one of the comments that were made yesterday about uh, the death penalty and alternative forms of, of uh, targeting that happens uh, in, in security societies. And I was thinking uh, partly about Lauren Bellance when she talks about the specific targeting of certain groups in her cruel op optimism of, of slow death, uh, and that there is uh, ways in which um, portions of not only society in the US, but in Europe, and not to speak in a, in a global context, sort of are uh, systemically deprived in such a way that, that their existence uh, uh, amounts to slow deaths in so many forms. And yet it's very hard for us to know how to, to address this. And as a literary scholar and, you know, drowning in 
Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Derrida, it's, it's, it's uh, not necessarily the most productive in that sense, but there, there must be alternative ways of doing it. If there's no other question, then I, I will talk to that. Um, I, I want to, like, yes, I, I totally agree, and, and in part that's where I was hoping I was, like, headed. But at the same time, I want to say that it's it's not super easy. And as I, like, I've done a lot of work trying to, to work in Indigenous studies. Um, and I'm, I'm Canadian, so I was working... On, like in indigenous, specifically like in Ganesak, anyway, whatever. L local, local to where I was brought up. Um, I'm not indigenous, and I was interested in trying to find alternate ontologies, right? And then I realized that I was just looking for this authentic idea of what I thought would count as an indigenous ontology or understanding of nature. Um, and I was positing it, the text that I was reading as like native informant, um, not engaging with it very theoretically either, not problematizing the text, um, and all for the purpose of this theoretical project of post-structuralism, <laughs> which is recentering, like, uh, right, like, like for the purposes of the West of European philosophy, which is also really troubling, um, putting like N Native American or Indigenous nations as like a natural resource for me to take and to use for this higher intellectual purpose. So, um, uh, so yuck, yuck, and yuck, right? So, like, yeah, I want to get outside, but it's it's actually extremely difficult and I'm only doing it from this particular position where I've been from, from which I've been educated that, that that has formed me that has shaped why I'm asking these questions and how I'm going to read these texts um, so yeah I just wanted to put that on the table in response to what you said okay. um, I have a, a thought also I guess in response to that and um, also, I guess, kind of to the conversation we had in our seminar, and Karen Barad told us a story which was very compelling to everybody about how she gave a talk to, in, to the philosophy department and kind of explained all of quantum field theory, or something like this, explained quantum field theory, and then like also kind of presented a feminist and philosophical or in queer deconstruction of it. And there was a someone from the physics department at the talk at UC, from UCSC physics department and kind of like went back to the physics department and told, I'm doing a really bad job of summarizing this story, but told everyone, well, she actually did, you know, she presented quantum field theory much better than we could have, like, wow. And I think everyone in our mm -hmm. seminar discussion was, you know, we, that was kind of a, like, it was very vindicating. We were all very pleased. Um, you know, Karen Barad presented quantum field theory better, better than any of the, you know, white man physicists or whatever at UCSC. Um, and I think that there is, like, and I, I, I'm finishing on my undergraduate now and there and I started in physics and I think kind of had the same feeling that Stephanie had of being like you know like why you know I'm doing well in physics but I don't really know like what this like sexism thing is about and I think as a, a feminist science studies in feminist science studies there is a certain kind of vindictive pleasure to be able to say like we are women and we can we can we can also articulate the models of math and the models of physics look women can do well mm -hmm. in sciences um, but I guess kind of in response to the first question that was asked, like, that's only, I mean, like, if we want to kind of deconstruct the, you know, authority of some types of knowledge, that's one type of scientific knowledge, but can we be comfortable with, like, wrong science? Like, why do we have to, like, why, why is it necessary for us to first learn the, you know, the science texts and then critique them? What if we don't know the science text to begin with? What if we present a bad description of quantum field theory and then present a queer kind of queer that bad description of quantum field theory or a wrong description of quantum field theory. So I, I mean, I don't know, I don't have an answer to this question, but I think it is an interesting thing to ask ourselves, like what if, um, what if we want to kind of critique 23andMe and DNA testing and African ancestry, but we don't understand how molecular genetics works? Um, do we need to learn that first and then present a critique or can we do it from, from somewhere else? I think, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would like to, um, to get back to the question about um, archive and the, the particular challenge of theorizing feminism from the global south and um, the idea of what is the, the, the archive, who, what is the norm, what is considered, you know, you know the, your location 
um, compared to the location of this globally shaped discourse, um, which may or may not or may have limited sort of um, applicability to to your to the, the material reality of, of you know of, of where you are located, and I couldn't help you know but think about that when I was listening to Karen Barat's presentation about time and what is the norm in terms of thinking about time because if you are from a space in which you, time is not necessarily linear um, where you know then it it's becomes it's interesting conceptually um, and and and. Um, and yet, at the same time, might not necessarily speak to a problematic that um, is existing, or you know, to, to a norm that what is your norm? And, and, and I think there was um, a talk about saying, well, this is our perceived notion of you know, this is what time means for us, and this is how it's going to be deconstructed. And yet, if you come from a particular, a, a different way of conceptualizing it already, the 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 work is interesting, but maybe not, you know, you, you're trying to work with how to, to apply it and make it relevant. Um, I think there's relevance in terms of, of the question of, you know, where we draw our, you know, our, you know, the epistemologies and things like that. Everyone exhausted. <laughs> Everyone's thinking. Uh, just to fill in space for a second, um, so I, I think there's a way in which this is something I'm having trouble putting into language at the moment. Is given the sequence of talks that we've had, what can we now sort of put on the table? about archive when we, we aren't drawing from examples that have used, you know, we have four examples in the room of specific projects with methodologies derived either from a history of methodology. We talked about this in my seminar too, sort of pure methodology, um, taking methodology on its own terms um, as a mode of inquiry versus, I said I work, um, but the work on incest made me uh, sort of redefine what the domain was of what I needed to do and what kinds of methodologies mattered. And I did an incredibly top-down project focused on the US. So I worked on print material only. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, but, and maybe that's what you meant about making visible your relationship to your, to the conditions of your own speculation. But, um, so I'm just thinking a lot about the two, the comment about archive and, uh, feeling like deep agreement about it, but also like wondering if other people in the room have archival materials and projects they are working on that they wanted to add to the conversation. Does that make sense as a question? Because otherwise we'll just come back to those same four talks over and over again, which were all excellent. But also, <laughs> you know, clearly there are other people in the room doing other archival work, I assume. Well, one of our uh, members in the group that I was in, uh, Olga from Poland, are you here? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, she was actually raising the question in terms of the archives of, of, uh, of uh, 
working classes that are actually absent. I don't know if you want to elaborate. I don't want to call you on the spot, but I thought it was very interesting. <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> so would you want to, to elaborate on that? Uh, that um, we were talking about um, <coughs> how we can think about roots and origins uh, and sort of like a desire to come back to the roots. Uh, and I was wondering whether this need um, is not only from the sort of need to have like um, narrative about yourself or your community um, or family, but also um, this a certain tension or opposition between um, people that have history and people that don't have history. Uh, so at least in like European context, that would be a tension between uh, the nobility that would have history versus uh, working class peasants that don't. So I was kind of touching upon that. Mm -hmm. So we had a great conversation in our session on um, unintended consequences, I think, and, and also sort of what what's happening um, with our theorizing, you know, not, not necessarily looking at what are the grounds for the theorizing, but, you know, or the work that we do, which is, but then what happens with it and how does it play? And maybe that's a different way to think about it, right? Rather than the archive, it comes from, you know, what what is it contributing to um, whether we like it or not. Um, and so I think that might be another way to think about um, how things travel, you know, and also think about time that we don't know about. Like, what's the, th that's the sad thing about the future is we really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, even if we can predict it, or we think we can predict it. Um, at least that's, I'm going to stick with that answer, <laughs> even though we might disagree about that. Um, so I think that, um, that that would be one sort of observation that we came up with in our session. But also, um, I want to get back to the question about can you do wrong science or whatever? Can you do sort of bad science? And, um, and then ask, you know, can you, can you do wrong poetry, right? And then still come up with a, an interesting outcome. And we would not phrase things that way, you know, in terms of, um, and since you said your, your piece was a poem, I, get to, I guess I can ask that question. You know, well, how is it that some forms of knowledge production can be right or wrong or bad or, or shoddy? I mean, I believe that there is such a thing as shoddy science. And, and another iteration, like if somebody were doing my some culture on a medical test that I was doing, I would really want to believe in the distinction between shoddy science and, and sort of more accurate science, right? So um, on the other hand, um, what kinds of discourses get play in terms of, you know, it can be it can be right or wrong and other things, the, the sort of figural, they're just um, they're not caught up in the same kind of evaluative judgments, and it would be interesting to ask why. Um, so I had a few questions, brief questions for each one of you, um, just to change things up a bit. Uh, to start with the last one, Angle, I was wondering if you could say something about your claim that honor is a Victorian project, um, and then maybe connect that up with Nelson and wonder about how um, the project, the desire to constitute an identity through something not, that's not a state of injury, um, thinking about, since both of those projects have to do more with identity, the way that subjectivity is constituted within power systems. Yeah, so um, there was a comment in Engel's talk, a brief one, about honor as being a Victorian project. Um, I know that you said it in passing, but it, it was interesting to me. And then 
thinking about the question of honor, um, the desire to, to celebrate some, some form of identity that's not constituted tutored through injury, um, if you understand that as being part of the impulse to take these sort of tests, um, since both of those talks kind of deal with identity formation. Um, and then yesterday, my question for Barad um, would be, I, I thought it was really important to, to um, think about how you framed your talk in terms of justice that Wilson asked. And I still, I, I felt your question was, your answer didn't satisfy me. Um, because I think that there are really interesting implications for justice. And so one of the things I wanted to hear was what pressure um, making ontological claims that refute causality and celebrate um, indeterminacy, what pressure that puts on the um, political rhetoric and legacy that we have inherited, since, uh, and maybe also asking you to speak more about the politics of responsibility, um, which you thought about in terms of inheriting a world um, through a sub a agential, an agential sub subject that is not the typical human subject. And then um, my question for Dusher, it has to do with uh, one of the things that I took away from your talk as being possibly the most productive in my thinking. Um, I enjoy the close readings. I come from philosophical methodology also. Um, is the idea of a pseudo-analogical, pseudo-literal, as a reframing of a lot of the projects within feminist theory. Um, in particular, the, if we think about the pseudo-literal as speaking to materiality in some way, essentialism is maybe the big stick away from that we inherit, um, and, but, but also requires us to think about the body. We want to think about bodies. Um, and then pseudo, the analogy, pseudo-analogical, as also speaking to something of the legacy of um, semiotics and, and meaning-making psychoanalysis potentially within feminist theory. Thank you. Do you have a better response to that before we um, Well, let's just maybe one or two and one or two more comments and then we'll go back to the, because, they, because then, I mean, they'll have a bit of time to, yeah. I mean, if there are one or two, yeah, go ahead. So I also wanted to thank our amazing um, workshop participants who helped me think about a lot of these things. And um, we found that kind of circulating around um, the Rigorian question of that which is not one became a generative place to think. And we went through a lot of the sort of categories, um, including that odd um, sort of space of the pregnant woman, right? And does that bring us back to this ancient question of um, sexual difference, right? Is like still, despite all the technology, the one who can become pregnant. Um, and yet, of course, the second you're pregnant, you're not one. You're, you know, both in the grip of all of these, of course, post 19th century Darwinian, Galtonian understandings of, of racialized um, genetic science and, you know, lineage. Um, so what, what does that do to try to sort of keep that moving, but also bring back to some of these, I think someone in our, our, our group called it the radical feminism, you know, which um, hasn't always been brought up um, in the room of what happens when you are the body that can become pregnant. Of course, it hooks into the rape questions, it hooks into um, the structural inequality questions, right? And brings us back to that question of the cut, Psychoanalysis hasn't been so much on the table um, over the last couple of days, but that, you know, what is that cut that differentiates? Um, is that the basis of sexual difference? And yet you can't have race without sex. So how do we sort of always be thinking those um, formations together? Um, and of course, the exchange of women and all of the important work that that's done throughout time, but also, you know, Via Levy, Strauss, Gail Rubin, these other kinds of genealogies that we wanted to um, kind of keep circulating, I think. And then one of the things that we came to, optimism of the will, um, was what sort of formations of kinship or community that somehow loose the grip of um, those forms um, and yet keep something like the identity politics. I think we all felt very moved by sort of the, um, the reminder that Alondra Nelson gave us about the, the absolute vitality of that 
in this world that's structured around the 1% of the 1%, just sucking more and more out of every body, but also very specifically structurally um, unequally made bodies. Um, and then trying to think maybe to sort of give a shout out to our dearly departed Stuart Hall about some of those other forms of articulation which would keep the language and the material um, together. And of course, Haraway's work on the work of the affinal um, as maybe other ways we could think to get out of that grip. So that doesn't in any way cover the amazingness of the folks in our group, but I just wanted to throw in some of those things. So if there aren't um, more questions from the floor, I think that we can go to the keynote speakers who are, of course, on the floor at the moment, but you know what I mean, you get my sense, um, to see if they'd like to respond to um, questions that have come up or comments. Um, so uh, can you volunteer yourself if you would like to go for it? Or not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so thank you for your, your, your comments. Um, I, am, I think so many of us are exhausted, so I'm just um, uh, amazed at the deafness of mind that still exists. Um, it's really impressive. Um, I guess I would, just a few things about, you know, Stephanie's um, comment, and it's come up again about the identity politics. I mean, I think that for me what's so important for Kambihi is that it's still relevant, and I think that the identity politics that we think of, yes, right, because Shirlane is my first lady, um, uh, who was one, a member of the collective uh, of New York City. So, but I think that, the, that, that part of what the, the stigmatization of identity politics has meant is that we sort of leave it as an atavist in 1977, and I think that to think seriously about what they're saying about identity politics, about thinking from where you are, doesn't preclude a like, new materialist approach or a feminist materialist approach, it doesn't preclude uh, a psychoanalytic approach, right? Um, it actually opens up a lot of spaces for actually, it's actually quite um, democratic and you know, potentially even universalizing in the work that it does. So I, would ju I just wanted to offer that. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't have a, I'm not trying to make a robust claim around identity politics. It may be a phrase that we can no longer use because it's been so, um, so much damage has done to it. But I just wanted to go back to that because it's not only them, it's again, you know, Marxist feminism, you know, um, I think it's a, an important sort of tradition to, to remember and to think about. Um, uh, the question about, um, uh, that you raised there about, um, can I write it down? I thought I wrote it here. Um, about the desire to create an identity and to constitute one not rooted in injury. I mean, I think that's exactly right, and that's partly why, um, when talking about the African Burial Ground Project, I dive into that dishy. I mean, I'm not terribly convinced by the activists' moves between race and ethnicity, but I'm trying to report that that's the move that they're trying to make precisely because they're trying to get away from or open up the possibility of moving away from an identity black or a caste, right, that's only rooted in injury. So I, I think that's right, but it's also about just the aesthetics and desire of self-making as well. So it's about, you know, a kind of other, a level of pleasure and being sort of free to, to um, free, <laughs> like the structure and agency problem, free, um, to, to make oneself to, in, in one's own way. Um, let's see. Uh, there was one comment about, was it, um, was it you, Ellen, that talked about types of anonymity? Yeah. Four types of anonymity. I didn't. I wasn't quite. I thought that was just compelling. I wasn't quite. Um, I, I mean, certainly for the genetic ancestry testing and the uses of it, there is a kind of anonymity or it's a desire to be anonymous from the injury, right? Or anonymous to the injury or something, right? That is, I think, generative um, for the activist work. Um, and there was another question. Um, uh, Ellen also raised this issue of, um, you know, a quest to find a coherent narrative that inevitably fails, but nevertheless we continue to try. So I think that's true. I think that's, you know, dare I say it, human nature and gigantic scare quotes. Um, but I think it's also the the case that um, that the work is is also a political work, as Gillian was saying, right? So that it's strategic work that's about 
knowing that there is a kind of existentialist sort of project there, but also that, that, that it's an explicitly, I think, political project that's interested in the process and that, the, and that activists and political projects are always having a utopian vision of trying and possibly succeeding, even though the, the, the odds are that we might fail to re-narrativize again and again. <clears throat> so now I'm never going to be able to look at the two slit experiment the same again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your really thought provoking questions, both from the panel and also from the floor. Um, these are these are really hard questions that I keep, you know, trying to. Um, ask myself as I try, you know, I come to these kinds of conferences and I think about how much I still need to read and still need to learn. Um, and so part of this, in terms of the question that you asked Stephanie about the archive, so I have so many thoughts about that. One is, you mentioned Gloria Anzaldúa's Borderlands and actually just uh, turned in a paper to, for a special issue of Parallax, where I take the notion of diffraction back to Anzal Dua and Trin Min Ha um, <clears throat> at a particular moment of Santa Cruz uh, in the late 80s and early 90s to open up this moment again to see, just echoing what Alondra was just saying as well, about a way in which it's not paying debts in an economic sense, but it's a way of um, listening still to what's going on and the reverberations that continue. So that's one of the thoughts that I have about it. But also this question about, um, about how I think of myself in all of this. Um, you know, so locating oneself is, also, is obviously um, something that I both think with and against, in a sense. Um, and, um, but I think the tension is important. And my responsibility to myself as a physicist goes back to my own activist work in terms of working for mobilization for survival when anti doing anti-nuclear work as I was a graduate student in physics and thinking about what are my responsibilities for enjoying this, for loving it, for having this kind of erotic, sensuous pleasure of learning this, this kind of brain candy that sends me wheeling, reeling all over the place. What What is my responsibility and I think part of the whole thing about interacting with my work is that I'm reiteratively being remade in terms of my relationship to physics every time I come to one of these conferences give one of these talks try to think through these um, you know these kinds of intricate problems in terms of the physics so going more and more deeply into the physics I wind up being whooshed out in terms of thinking about um, still what, what are the politics, what are my responsibilities, what kind of effect does it have. I've noticed that you know a lot of people now will refer to entanglement and say it's this, 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 and that. And you know, so there's a certain kind of uptake with those concepts. And yes, we don't, you know, we don't control them uh, whatsoever, and that's part of what I'm trying to get at in terms of, so there were several questions. I just want to get this right here in terms of my notes of everybody's questions about, first of all, um, I think that your question over here about um, refuting causality and celebrating indeterminacy and what is my responsibility to that. So first of all, I do want to say, you know, what work does that do at this particular moment in time if I got the question right. Um, and so part of what I want to say is, part of what's at stake for me is not refuting causality, very specifically. And I have to say that I know this is a very unpopular position in a way. I've tried to talk about causality in different <coughs> feminist uh, conferences and people are just kind of shaking in my, their heads at me sometimes saying, there's that physicist, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Um, so I've, been I've, been trying, I've been trying to do this in a way because I think our, we have very 
little imaginaries. You know, our imaginaries are very kind of um, not up to the task. And I'm not saying I have an answer. I'm bringing a question. Because when, when you say, you know, uh, what you were saying, Ellen, in terms of that, um, you know, what is, what are, is um, this queer agency in imaginative practices of justice to come, which reconfigures us irrespective of our own will. And then also, Jillian, you were also saying something about, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, what it is, you know, it contributing to whether we like it or not. Uh, you know, and when, Ellen, when you speak of this question of will, there's the thing about free will, you know, uh, and or there's determinism. And of course, neither of those choices sit well with us. I think that's some of the reason we go to post-structuralist theory, is to trouble some of that. At least that's how I understand what post-structuralist theory is after, to some extent. What different imaginaries do we have for causality? So I like to think, because it's my responsibility to think with my discipline. So Stephanie, you were saying something about you know, going to the other in a way to find uh, you know, the, the kind of problematics of mining the other to bring it back home and so on. You know? So um, I think about starting from where I am and doing what I can do. And I don't expect everybody to do quantum physics. You know? That's not, this is my responsibility in, in a sense um, to you know, try to trouble the physics and try to invoke the physics while troubling the physics to show the ways in which its own authority works against itself, you know? I think it's really important to hold those things together. So these new, you know, so some part of what I'm interested in are new imaginaries for talking about causality because it really matters in people's lives if we're saying that there's a high rate of cancer around a certain place to say, you know, what are the causal factors involved? So for example, if I'm at the Love Canal and there's a high rate of cancer or something, I might want to get the people the hell out of there. You know, if I'm the, at the Mayo Clinic and there's a high rate of cancer, I probably don't want to do that, you know? I mean, the, so, I mean these causal relations are really, uh, it seems to me that we need, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm asking myself this question too, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to, to give an answer, but the way that I you know, try to think about interaction as a different kind of causality or a, a, a troubling of this usual notion of causality. And yes, I'm not addressing all cultures for all time. That's part of what I'm trying to trouble is physics, physics, uh, Western physics and its notion of universality, that things just apply here, there, and everywhere. And so that's also why in terms of thinking about justice, when I have the question about justice before me, I can't pretend to know what that means here, there, and everywhere, okay? That in a sense that the questions of justice have to emerge from wherever you are, you know, in terms of um, thinking about what it is that, uh, you know, what are the, the kinds of injustices to begin with that have to be addressed and so, thinking about materially in the specificity of, that, of the particular examples, I think argues against a kind of universalizing theory where we do the cookie cutter thing and say, we'll use it over here, we'll use it over there, and, and so on. So that's part of why I was giving, trying to give the example yesterday of what we do with the science and justice program at UCSC, because it's a question of sitting with each of the groups doing the different science of trying to um, figure out what does justice mean in this situation? What would it look like? Um, and, uh, you know, and it's different for different examples. Um, the question of um, responsibility and also uh, the question of uh, not, there not being a typical uh, human subject. I'm not, I'm, I think my notes are probably too um, rough here. But the question also about rethinking the human subject. So it's not, I'm not trying to say, um, you know, and also the question of molecularization. Have I molecularized things? Um, or even lower than that, right? right? So Alondra's stuff is at the level of the molecular in a sense. My stuff is even lower than that. Um, except at the same time, everything that I tried to present to you, that entire thing was an electron. In other words, um, 
you know, the question of what constitutes an electron is also related to the question of what constitutes the subject. And the, the question also of what constitutes the human and the way in which the human gets produced and, and reiterated and questioned and stabilized and destabilized in different uh, contexts is something that I think we need to trace the entanglements about, okay? So, uh, so agency, I would say, has something to do with the reiteration that is, uh, you know, that is a part of this kind of materiality um, that does come as I understand it, at least for myself, in terms of a kind of indeterminacy, which is not to celebrate indeterminacy. I think that's a really different thing, but I think some people will take it up like that. And so I think I still, you know, think that there's things worth thinking about with regard to your question about that. But the question of um, <clears throat> how agency moves through the world, not granting agency, I think, to different people or not more or less to different degrees is a different type of question of seeing agency move through the world in the way in which it constitutes subjects differently in different positions materially, I think are important feminist questions. Thanks. So. Thanks. I know we're ending, I know we're ending in a, a tiring way. Um, I wanted to come back to the question of the archive um, and just, just say what a good question I think that this is. It seemed to me in the um, breakout session that we had, um, and no one exactly disagreed with me, that, 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 that maybe there was some consensus around the idea that you, you really could not take an archive or assume an archive or a relationship to an archive without assuming at the same time that you were made in problematic ways, rigidifying or consolidated or governmentalised, historicised, ways that we would also want to problematise. And that you would be forgetting many archives and forgetting things that should be in your archive. That you couldn't be included or include yourself without a number of exclusions. Exclusions of what you should remember or how you should work. <coughs> exclusions of others and how they should work and what they should be. You know, the desubject subjectivations that go with subject subjectivation, the problems of the ways in which you get subject subjectivised, what, what's lost in that for you, for others, in ways you can predict and calculate, in ways you can't predict and calculate, both of those just as important together, and, and that there would have to be a paradoxical archive that just worked with all of that, and in our session that was named Troubling with Haraway or with me, Suffering Paradox with Brown, and there's lots of other languages we could use for that as well. It, it seemed to me that there was a kind of agreement about thinking like that in our, in our breakout session. I don't know if everybody here would agree, but to, to me that feels roughly right for this room, that kind of thought. That there's not inclusion without exclusion, there's not inclusion without a really problematic inclusion as well. And there's not a good solution there, there's just doing all of that together. I, I, I think we all get that. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's so it seems to me, until someone wants to sort of fight me on that point, which I'd be really happy about. <laughs> What I said in the session that we had was, at the same time, doesn't that sound too easy as a thought? I mean, isn't that just too sayable as a politics, given how unbelievably hard that's supposed to be? That, that's supposed to be an impossible politics. And yet, in a way, I feel like it's something that we would all agree with, more or less. And that doesn't sound right. Um, and that was, what, that was what I sort of wanted to catch for a moment in the breakout session that we had. What we, this is just to pick up sort of Ranji's suggestion that we sort of come back with some of the things that came up in the discussion. One of the things that came up also in the discussion is that um, I think the reason that that sounds too easily sayable is just, just if you lose the specificity of the archives specifically, that it sounds roughly like the right politics until you get to the, the detail of Karen's work 
or other Karens work. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, when you, when you get to poor, poor, poor Penelope's work for getting Lisa Rigori, <laughs> sorry, it's a joke, but not, um, or, <laughs> or, or, or Alondra's work, and, and then, and then of course, the, or anyone, anyone's work of anyone who's here, of course, our work, our work, what, when we, what we start doing, we start thinking, our, our archive, our practice, our responsibility, a, and then, of course, it's not an easy politics that we sign up to at all. It's, it's, it's immensely difficult, and we all know that, you know. So I think that that, that makes sense. That it just means we, we need the specificity. It doesn't work as a general kind of a thing to say. It works when we go to a specific paper and we start asking specific questions. Um, and and, and, I, and I find that interesting too. And, and I think I just want to say something from that place. Um, back, back to Ellen, um, if, if I could, that I, I had this very interesting experience um, uh, of... Um, you know, as someone who's written a lot about Lusa Rigori, being asked to remember Lusa Rigori. But, that, but that's not wrong. But, 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 but I did have that right, you know, that experience. And, and actually, if I, if I can refer to it, I, I, I hope, um, you know, I, I very, very warmly I'll refer to this. I also had the experience of someone um, suggesting that I might like to look at History of Sexuality, Volume 1 by Michelle Foucault. Uh, that, that, in fact, his analysis of sexuality might be very helpful to me. Uh, <laughs> and yes, and yes, that's right. Um, <laughs> And yes, that's right. And 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 I, I I just find that so interesting for us at this point at which we all accept we all accept that the right question is what what how we are made as we're made and what 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 is forgotten as we include and what what archive is left as we include and we we accept that that's absolutely the right politics, and then at that point what what our responsibility is is to start trying to mark what we think is the really significant exclusion and loss. At, or desubjectivation, or what you will, at the moment at which you're centering or working. Like, presumably, what that means as a methodology, as a practice, is we need to start looking for what's being occluded constantly. And I don't think anybody here would disagree with that. It's just that in the actual literal specificity of that, where do you turn? And you could turn in, in anywhere. And I don't say that cheaply. I'm saying that's right. We could turn anywhere. And that is fascinating. There is, there is the whole world enfolded now, every gesture. And we get to look everywhere for what was occluded. That's methodologically fascinating. And it's exhausting. And it's no wonder we're tired. Um, you know, and it's, the, it's always the right question. You know, doesn't X forget Y is always the right question for us now. But which one? Is Ellen right to say to me then, haven't I forgotten Lucy Rigori? You know? Now, on the one hand, it's like, yeah, abs absolutely. Like, what could be more right than that? That the thing we asked me to remember today is Lisa Rigori, that person that I remembered, you know, qu quite well for a time, and yet I'm sure I forgot her constantly, even as I was trying to remember her. In my closest moments of proximity, I have no doubt I never got her in every way that matters. But at the same time, you know, I, I, I gave her some time. Is, 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 <laughs> yeah. Is, is Ellen right to take me back to Lucy Rigori? Well, well, yes, yes. Because do I get to say now, oh, no, that's exhausted for me. You know, she's exhausted. I'll, you know, sh should, should we be, be returned to the Combahee River Collective? Yeah, yes, yes. Should we, re should we be returned with deconstruction and psychoanalysis? Yes. And then at the same time, we know those gestures are going to be very problematic. Does everybody want the thing that I most forgot today to have been Lucy Rigori? Of all the possibilities, do you want it to be that <laughs> sexual difference? No, and I'm don't, I don't mean it's not right. I'm just saying, yeah, on the one hand, it's the best thing to say. On the other hand, don't you want me to have forgotten a whole bunch of other things that we might not have thought of? And what do we do from that spot? And that's not easy. That's right, that dilemma. Is it right that we want to start thinking politics of combi here with psychoanalysis and deconstruction. Now, there's a reading I could stand up and do. Deconstruction and psychoanalysis, I probably could do it if you paid me a lot of money um, <laughs> and set that to me as the task. But is that the right archive? You, you know, like, do you want that to be deconstructed? Um, it, it, it's, it's possible, it's a good idea, but I'm just saying there'll be a lot that's also forgotten, a lot that fails, a lot that's problematic, and that's right too. So. I'm only ending there, I guess, guess, with those two thoughts, that it's so interesting to me that the immensity of forgotten archives is not, it's not something that means you get to say, oh, well, I would have forgotten everything, so don't trouble with me the things I've forgotten. It means, yeah, I really would have forgotten everything, and it might be that it is the best way to catch that or the worst, and both of those things are right. Um, and so I think it just does place a really fascinating burden of responsibility that some, sometimes 
uh, you know, you want to set up two figures and think about in the most fragile moment how one white French philosopher slightly forgotten, slightly caught and slightly changed one other. And that's, that's interesting and it's got immensity in it too. And other times you want to think about everything that that forgets and that's right too. And it seems to me that that's a moment of politics that we're, you know, that, that, that sort of is something that's shared by the four papers that you heard, that in a sense, each of those four papers will probably agree with those kinds of gestures and their difficulty. And I think that's, that's the way that I'm sort of ending the um, conference thinking about archives and how interesting they are to me at the moment. I just wanted to thank everybody for those thoughts about archive and all the ways that they came up. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Karen. I really didn't want to have the last word, <laughs> <laughs> especially after the last three interventions now. I'm just going to have to lecture for an hour. I hope you all are ready. <laughs> um, actually, I'm going to be, I'm going to be quick. Um, so I, I, I'll start with the Victorian project question and um, move back to Ellen's uh, comments. Um, so all I, on, on, on that, what I was saying was that um, actually rape has long been defined as a war crime. And when feminists set out, when radical feminists set out in their various forms um, to criminalize rape anew with the uh, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, um, they were very explicit about how they wanted to change the understanding of rape and they've carried that through to the definition of it in the Rome Statute. Um, and as I said, I think in the Q&A, Janet Halley's written a lot about that. Um, but the way in which it was defined in the Geneva Conventions had to do with honor um, specifically, and they said, and, and usually so it was thinking about the harm that was done to the men by having women raped, and they said we want to focus specifically on women um, and the harm that's done to women. And so what I was pointing out is that in the way in which it's unfolded, um, and in the way that harm has continued to be understood, they've, I think, unwittingly reinforced that very idea they were trying to get away from. Um, and, and even in trying to formulate what I just said, I was thinking about um, the comment, the, the way that, um, Ellen, you define, in part, so you were really easy on me, but you were defining, <laughs> if it's, if it's, if it's the things we, I, it seemed we were agreeing on that I wanna think maybe I'm not sure. Um, because you said that I talked about the ways that appropriation happened and that the ideas traveled, and that came up in our small group also. And so I wanted to go, I, I, I don't want to just say that it's appropriation. Um, so maybe this is just reiterating something that I said again in the Q&A, although I, I, I want to have the discussion about state feminism in Norway, because I think that, that that's actually a really, really, interesting analogy, so I'm very glad you mentioned it, and, and, I, and I hope we have a chance to, to talk more about it. Um, but, uh, but the idea about governance feminism really does say we can't, I mean, the we is a, is a question there, but um, that those were feminists um, with particular views um, that some of us long disagreed with, some of us didn't long disagree with. But over time, things have changed. Um, They've been taken up by other people who consider themselves to be feminist, including Hillary Clinton, right? Um, and who can check off the box of, I just did a great thing for women and really feel it. So, and, and, and really does. I mean, I, so I wanna take seriously um, that that work is something that they see as very important as feminist. Um, and, and that it wasn't, that the appropriation idea was, I was actually saying there was a confluence of interest um, and that configuration changes over time, what the confluence is, although there are some things that we can see that are similar about them over time. Um, and, and so that, it's not, it's not just that then the, you know, that through sex panic, the religious right took it over. Actually, there was a, there, there was, there, there was a, 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 an intentional, um, you know, strange bedfellows they were, but they were bedfellows. Um, so, so a lot of what I try to do by talking about feminist success is saying, okay, we need to take seriously what those successes were. And I was thinking about this in relationship to, I think, Ara's question that I was kind of, I was, I was resisting and yet I was wanting to say more and what was it, what was it? And I think partly what I was experiencing was that maybe the, the, the way of, the, the, the move to say this is institutionalized or particular to your field 
might have been a way to say, look, most, of, most feminists don't believe that or do that, or it doesn't circulate that way in other places, that it's different. And it undoubtedly is different, but, I, but what I was trying to do in my own way at looking even at multiple spaces around the resolution was to say, the resolutions and the discourse around them were to say that there are particular ideas out there that are feminist ideas that do have power in multiple spaces and, and places. Um, and however sophisticated the thinking we might have, actually, it's not, it's not, it's not necessarily penetrating in those areas. And I use that word advisedly. Um, <laughs> then the last thing I wanted to say was about agency, because I, and I, so I'd love thoughts after some time, drinks, whatever. Um, so I have to say, I've had a discomfort always in this work of talking about the denial of agency that comes, so the denial of, of military, sexual, and political agency of women. Because for one, and, and actually what Karen just said was very useful about um, agency moving through the world, and it's not something you do or don't have. Um, and at the same time, I'm showing that actually a lot of feminists do have agency, a lot of women do have agency, right? And actually a lot of women have agency even in the areas in which we're denying that they do. Um, but, but I also, and I have it in a footnote somewhere in the PTO, I mean, I don't believe there is, I mean, just to be clear, any such thing as clear agency, right? So I mean, everything, and, and, and I mean, you just said it a little bit, I mean, it's, Everything, we're always constrained in multiple ways and places and blah, blah, blah. So somehow I feel like it's okay to talk about the denial of it as long as I don't suggest that the answer is some kind of full or complete agency. I think I don't need to say that, but I just felt like mm -hmm. I should. Um, <laughs> thank you all. Thanks all of you so much for coming, contributing. Thanks especially right now to our roundtables who really do have sort of the hardest job trying to bring everything together. And to all the moderators, speakers, seminar leader, leaders, staff, students, all of you for your great comments, questions, interventions. I hope you really come back next year and um, so we can continue the conversation. Thanks for coming.